Yeah. So from a climate perspective, it's a little more subtle. Um, clouds don't directly kill people with respect to climate, but there's this image of the planet shows essentially the two important things about clouds. Um, from a climate perspective, clouds are white and clouds are cold. And the white part is they reflect energy away from the earth. So if you see this cloud deck, it's white. If you think of that orange bit as being glint off the darker ocean, the darker ocean will absorb more energy than the clouds. And you see how high those towers are from space. They're much colder than the surface. So they radiate, the tops of those clouds radiate at a much colder temperature and they radiate energy back down. They act as a blanket to keep energy in, in the Earth's system radiating at a colder temperature. Um, the white part is the shortwave radiation. The um, cold part is the long wave or infrared radiation. So what does this look like quantitatively? Well, this shows a scale of the cloud radiative effect. So what you do is you look at the, the top of the atmosphere fluxes, and then you recalculate that, assuming the cloud wasn't there. And you can make calculations like this. And so at the top, uh, that's the shortwave effect, the white clouds. And it's a uniformly, basically a cooling effect. Um, you'll notice it is zero over the brightest surfaces. So over the deserts and over the ice sheets, the underlying surface is very bright without the clouds, so the cloud doesn't do much. But over the dark ocean, those effect, cooling effects get fairly large. And then if you look at the long wave, those are the, the coldest clouds. The largest long wave warming, that heat trapping, is where the clouds are the coldest in the tropics. So those are the high thin cirrus in the tropics and thick clouds in the storm track regions. And that's about 26 watts of cooling. The short wave is about 40 watts, or, or sorry, 26 watts of warming, 40 watts of cooling. You get a net effect of cooling the planet by something like 20 watts per meter squared. So if you doubled carbon dioxide, you would increase the radiative forcing of the planet. You'd warm it by four watts per meter squared. And so small perturbations to this cloud number because of, say, changes to the environment might have a big lever on um, that warming signal. And this is what we call a feedback. Um, and the overall feedback, that what's important to understand about how much energy we're going to get in the future is understanding the sum of all these feedbacks. The largest feedback is the Planck feedback. That's just sigma t to the fourth. So if you warm up a surface, it radiates more energy away. That's the negative feedback against all these things push against. Water vapor is the largest greenhouse gas, and it's a very strong warming effect. Um, if you warm up the planet, you get more water vapor in the atmosphere. That increases the heat trapping of water vapor, and that is a very that's a positive feedback. The lapse rate feedback is slightly negative because more water vapor raises the emission height, and that cools off the emission temp that um, changes the emission temperature. And so if you they act in opposition to each other. So the sum of those two things is is um, they sort of offset. And what I'm showing is a series of different model simulations, CMIP3 being older models from 2006, CMIP5 being models from 2013. This appeared in the previous IPCC report. I just haven't updated the figure. Um, and then you'll notice this cloud term, these cloud feedbacks. This is how the cloud radiative effect responds to warming the planet. And it's all over the place. Uh, it's the largest uncertainty in coming up with that total number, which is the total feedback. And then the albedo feedback is small and fairly positive. That's uh, the fact that if you warm up the planet, you tend to melt the snow and ice and the surface gets darker. But the cloud feedbacks are complicated and these models, they don't even all agree on the overall sign of the feedbacks. And that makes it very important to understand what's going on for, for climate. And so the way we calculate these feedbacks in the future is using uh, numerical models and um, the way we calculate uh, the future weather in the next couple of days is also using numerical models. And um, what is a climate model or a weather model? Well, it's essentially a giant set of integrated spreadsheets where you can think of at every point on the planet, you have a budget and it's a budget of mass and energy. It's the amount of water and clouds. It's the amount of water in the atmosphere. It's the temperature. Um, it's where the properties of the land surface and you link all these spreadsheets together, you undergo transformation processes at each of these points, and then they all communicate with each other and they get linked together and you iterate this forward in time, as sort of a giant budget exercise. And you do this in three dimensions over every point on the planet. And that hopefully representing all these processes gives you a uh, 
realistic set of solutions. And it actually generally tends to work pretty well. So what is cloud microphysics and where do the clouds fit in all this? Well, this is sort of a, um, a notional time step loop of going through all these processes. You start with the dynamics, which is how the air moves around. Um, you then calculate exchanges with the surface. There then is a representation of sort of non-local turbulence or vertical motions, the deep convective thunderstorm motions that move air up and down in the atmosphere. There's then usually a shallow turbulence that controls sort of the shallow, shallow clouds, the boundary layer, what's happening near the surface of the earth. Uh, it can be cloudy or it can just be turbulent and not cloudy. And then all that information gets passed to a cloud microphysics scheme. And the microphysics essentially, and, and the names and orders on here correspond to the community atmosphere model, which is what's in uh, CESM, the community earth system model. Um, that takes condens condensed water and it speciates it. It turns it into uh, rain, it turns it into, or it, it freezes it. It calculates the number, it calculates in certain cases, the number concentration or size of the different particles. And it takes information both from the turbulent schemes and the large scale sort of condensation, along with an aerosol model. That aerosol model gives you the amount of particles in the atmosphere. If you have more particles, you tend to form more cloud drops. They tend to be smaller. That affects the evolution of the system. And all that information gets passed to a representation of the radiative transfer. So you calculate both the gaseous and, all, and cloudy sky radiative transfer, how the energy moves in the system. That gives you an updated state. And you now have new updates and, and tendencies on things like temperature and all the different water and chemical species. Then you pass that to the dynamics again, and you use the geophysical fluid dynamics equations to iterate that forward in time. And then it starts again. Repeat. And of course, the computer is doing it much faster than I just described it, hopefully. Um, and it's doing it at every point on the planet. So there's several different types of microphysics schemes, and these are used in models at different scales. Um, let me get this. This is a little laser pointer, right? There we go. Ah, here we go. Um, and they go sort of from from simple simplified bulk schemes to bin schemes to Lagrangian or particle based schemes. And typically, as the schemes get more complex, the scale of the model that we're working with goes down because we can't. They get more complex, and we can't afford to run them in larger and larger computers. So for global and mesoscale models, so global models are run at scales from say 10 kilometers up to 100 kilometers for the weather or climate. Mesoscale models go down to a few kilometers, usually over one region of the planet. We typically use a bulk scheme and you either define say one moment, which means you're just prognosing a mass. Um, you say you have X amount of water in the atmosphere and you may give it a diagnostic size. You may say that those particles are 10 microns in diameter, about the width of a human hair. Um, or you can actually have a prognostic or predicted uh, second moment, which would give you a functional form where you can actually predict the size distribution, which would be that sort of PDF that I've shown there. A bin scheme, instead of representing the mass in of the total amount of, say, cloud particles, you would represent the mass in each of a discrete number of size categories. And you might have 30 different sizes that would then make up an actual distribution, but each one of those little bars on the histogram could go up and down independently by interacting with the other bars and with the rest of the environment. That's called a, a bin scheme. And those are often used either in mesoscale models or even in smaller idealized parcel models or in large eddy simulations, which are trying to represent the actual turbulent motions in the atmosphere at fairly small scales. And then finally, you have another class, which is Lagrangian or particle-based schemes, where you're actually representing individual particles as sort of statistical representations of a set of particles. And they're sometimes called superparticles because you calculate how they interact with the, with the different other different sized particles that are present or cloud drops. And then uh, you statistically multiply that by the number of drops in each of those uh, size categories. So, but it's a little more detailed and it actually follows those particles as they move through the atmosphere. So that's the most computationally expensive. Typically what we do is we use these bulk schemes. Um, and you have a series of processes. This is a really nice figure from Axel Seifert. Um, 
what we do is we represent different classes of, uh, of, of clouds. So there are cloud droplets and cloud ice. There is snow, which is sort of the fast falling ice and raindrops, which is the fast falling liquid. And then some schemes intermediate to that, there's a intermediate mixed phase that's either called commonly grapple or hail. And it's basically ice that has rhymed liquid onto it that's frozen or slushy and has different properties. Um, all these things have, and then there's water vapor at the top, and these all have transformations between them. Um, heat processes are these mixed phase processes that exchange between the liquid and ice or the freezing process for cloud ice. Conversion processes where the vapor deposits on from one class to another. And then aggregation processes where um, particles will grow and change size. So they may fall faster when you get things like rain formation. And then ices in particular is liquid cloud drops are spheres, and we know their density because it's liquid water. So that makes them easier to deal with than ice particles, which number one are sort of metastable. I, uh, you can have ice or liquid at sub freezing temperatures in the atmosphere. So you actually have to freeze it. And when it freezes, it's not easy to calculate and depends on the other aerosol particles in the atmosphere. And the density and fall speeds can vary strongly by the shape and how the particles grow. So there's a lot of complexity in cloud microphysics that govern the importance of these cloud radiative properties and the importance of things like formation of grapple and hail, um, which can grow to extreme sizes in the right conditions and become damaging. So rain formation is really a, often called a collision coalescence process. So you start with a population of small drops. They're moving around, but they tend to be falling a little bit because they undergo gravitational settling. And the bigger they are, the faster they fall. And they'll actually hit other drops and they'll start collecting them. And so the larger ones get larger. And at some point they start falling fast enough that they're really, it runs away and they go into raindrops. So the, the radius gets bigger as they sort of self-collect each other. And then we sometimes call this a auto conversion as they start falling faster. And then they accrete smaller drops, these blue ones, or they self-collect each other on the rain side. And that line, that dashed line where we decide what's cloud and rain is somewhat arbitrary. And we usually do that in the bulk distributions where we have to actually have two classes of those. So approximating the rain formation process in a bulk scheme looks something like this. So we have cloud droplets going into raindrops. And I'm going to spend most of this time, most of my time talking about liquid. Um, ice is fascinating. And I know several of us, of us at the table spend a lot of time worrying about it. But we're going to start with just trying to do the liquid problem today. Um, so we approximate sort of this auto conversion and accretion process. And that's one of the things we do. So we have this evaporation condensation of crowd drops to start with that we get the cloud droplets to begin with. And that's usually we just look at the amount of water vapor and the temperature. And if it's super saturated, we form some cloud drops. Um, auto conversion is approximating this stochastic collection process. And it's a little bit artificial because we're moving things from cloud drops to raindrops when it really is a continuous distribution. And I'll show this tends to be a little bit uncertain. Um, evaporation of raindrops is also important in a lot of these systems. And evaporation of raindrops causes changes in energy. It actually you put energy into evaporating uh, evaporating water, and so it actually cools the atmosphere. This is very important for driving the organization of deep convective motions. Um, and it can be difficult because the evaporation can be size dependent. And then there's a lot of things in this picture that are still unknown, which I'm not going to get into um, quite today, but it can actually affect some of these things. So traditionally, we learn this auto conversion and accretion process, and that's a deliberate choice of term, um, with a very simple model. In this case, it's a, a regression to a more detailed model. So you take the explicit auto conversion rate, which is calculated in this case from large eddy simulations using an explicit bin model with all those calculations. And you then come up with a fit for how the cloud drops of some size change into raindrops. And then another fit for how the raindrops accrete the cloud drops. And you'll notice that on the top equation here, auto conversion is a positive factor of the mass of cloud drops. So the more cloud drops you have, the, oh, sorry, 
not the more, the more mass you have, the higher the autoconversion. It is inversely proportional to the number concentration. So the more drops you have, the smaller they are, and they don't tend to fall as fast. They don't tend to turn into rain as quickly. So if you think about having a few big drops, they tend to fall out faster. If you have a lot of small drops, they don't really turn into rain very easily. And then accretion is simply a mass-based thing. Um, it's based on the mass of rain and the mass of condensate. So this is an emulator. It's an empirical fit to another model that we call truth. Um, there's quite a bit of scatter here. And you'll notice how that functional form gets extrapolated. There we go. That's the 420 to Albany or something. Um, so what we decided to do is let's see if we can use new techniques to actually cut out the middleman here. Um, so we're going to try to build a machine learning emulator for the stochastic collection process to do this more correctly, or um, at least to try to, to, cut, to basically see if we can do this in a, in a more varied and, and detailed way. So again, the bulk scheme on the right, we just have that black line, basically. The bin scheme allows us to represent all these different populations of the, the number of drops in each of these different size categories. So one of the reasons we don't do this is because if we have 32 variables, which is typically what you'd use in a bin scheme, it's much more expensive than four. Four is what we do in the bulk scheme. We have mass and number for both liquid and rain. Um, so what we're going to do is actually break up the bulk distribution. So take that functional form as the black line and just simply turn it into a bunch of bins. And we can do that for the liquid and for the rain. Um, and then we can actually insert the sort of detailed process for the stochastic collection and have all these bins interact. And then we're going to recompose our distribution after we've done that. And that's actually great. We've done this using the stochastic collection kernel from the Tel Aviv University or tau bin microphysics scheme. Um, and we're replacing the existing treatment in CESM um, or CAM6, which is a, the atmospheric general circulation model that's in CESM. And when we do that, we get some interesting results that'll show, but it actually slows down the entire model by a factor of five. So it becomes a little bit unusable for climate simulation. So we're then going to build a neural network emulator of this as truth and see if we can put it back into CAM and recover all the higher order moments and statistics we want, but also see if we can recover the speed. And the punchline is we actually think we're able to do this. and We think we get some really interesting results that would justify it. So what this is, and so what we're actually doing is what we're predicting is we are running the process rates, or sorry, we are running the process and we are coming up, we start with an initial distribution and we end up with a final distribution. We take the final distribution of bins and we recompose that back into these black distributions, these bulk forms. Um, and then we look at the difference between the initial bulk form and the final bulk form. And we call that the tendency over that time step. And then the tendency is what we apply to the model. And the tendency is what we actually use the machine learning model to emulate. So, we put this in and the training data is actually calculating it instantaneously in the climate model. And what we're trying to do then is we have the inputs of the atmospheric state and the initial size distributions of the rain and the liquid. And the output is the tendencies on that at each of these points. And when we do this, so let's just focus on not the emulator, but just putting the bin code in there. Um, the emu or sorry, the bin code is the purple line, which is very close to the blue line on the top. And the orange line is the bulk scheme. And what we're showing is the log of a series of process rates, which is, this is the rain tendency, uh, QRDT. This is the number, the rain mass. This is the number concentration for um, liquid. This is the number concentration for rain when it is less than zero. And this is the number concentration for rain when it is greater than zero. The um, condensate mass is simply the uh, negative of the rain mass because the condensate becomes rain. So one's minus, one's plus. And so we're actually going down to some pretty small numbers. These are in units of mixing ratio or number concentration per second. And we're looking at typical time steps on the order of 
um, a thousand seconds, so ten to the third seconds. So these are still these are moderate numbers, but you can see they're actually very different distributions between the stochastic collection model, which is the bin code in these lines, and you can see we get sharp peaks in um, the control code when we look at these uh, tendencies. So there's some big differences here, um, but they're actually you can see the punchline. The blue line that you can barely see is the distribution from the emulator. It actually reproduces quite well the um, training data, which is what the purple one is. And so this is actually looking at it in a slightly different, this is actually just looking at a, a scatter plot of what these tendencies look like. And just to note, you know, once we start getting down in this region here where there's all the scatter, these are really not significant amounts of liquid water. Um, there, we're talking about tendencies of on the, these are on the order of um, a part below 10 to the ninth is like a part per million per time step. It's a very small amount for most of the atmosphere. So we actually, you get some differences between the bin and the bulk scheme, but they do tend for the significant parts of the distribution up here, they tend to line up somewhat. Um, rain number is kind of all over the place, which is interesting. Um, but Basically, what this says is that in the control case, we get more frequent small um, QR and changes in number concentration, and it's compensated by less frequent higher values. Uh, and these number, number concentration tendencies for rain are larger in the um, existing microphysics code here than they are in the tau bin code. So there's some fundamental and systematic differences between the detailed treatment and the existing treatment. So now how do we emulate this? Well, it's kind of interesting. We um, run it for two years. We obtain instantaneous hourly output. We sample it. We don't get every hour. We sample it over the, over the, the annual cycle and we do take it over the whole planet um, and the diurnal cycle also. We filter and subsample the data to find the grid points with realistic amounts of cloud water. So we sort out a lot of those small points. Um, there's a bunch of transfer, transformation and normalization of the inputs and outputs. So we sort out points that are where the tendencies are zero, and we also normalize and put them in log space. And then um, there are classifier networks to classify the zero and non-zero, and then deep neural networks to predict the non-zero values. And then most of what I'm going to talk about is evaluating and interpreting these neural network predictions. This is done actually with a series of different emulators in the original version. Um, and David John is working now with us on see if we can't streamline this into sort of one network using some different methods. And I should say we are embedding, basically we train it offline and then we get a series of weights for the network. And I'm not gonna talk in too much detail about the network design, but there's more detail in the paper. We, we can talk more about that. But then that's basically applied as a series of weights to calculate the results in line in the climate model. Uh, directly interfacing with the Fortran code. So this is the same plot as before, except instead of showing the bin code versus the control, this is the bin versus the emulator. And now things are looking much better. It's basically on the one-to-one -one line for the de high density of points all the way down. And you can see the R squared values on these things are approaching one uh, for the accuracy in almost all cases. So the emulator actually seems to work to reproduce the process that we want when we trained it. Um, I showed this before, the blue line and the purple line are very similar. Uh, the density is similar and it looks much more similar obviously than the control, which is what we would hope. Um, what's interesting of course, is that when we run this, we then apply these tendencies and occasionally we get answers that don't really work in the model. Um, the climate model microphysics is what we call time split, which means you take one time and all the different processes that you saw on that spaghetti diagram for cloud microphysics are calculated based on the same state. And when they're combined, they don't always add up. So we have a series of, of constraints and fixtures on things. And we do actually put a, an individual constraint and a, a mass fixer on the emulator tendencies to make sure that when we come up with the final result, we're not creating or destroying water. If we're converting from liquid to rain, from cloud drops to raindrops, we wanna make sure we have the same mass of water that we end up with when we started. 
And occasionally this doesn't work. And actually it doesn't work quite a lot of the time. You'll see almost 30% of the time we have to make some adjustments. And it's typically happening low in the atmosphere. And it's typically happening in the subtropics. And for those of you familiar with patterns of clouds and what the general circulation of the atmosphere looks like, these are sort of the dry regions on the planet. There's not many clouds there and there's not much water there. So the emulator tendencies are being corrected, we've discovered really when we're in parts of the distribution that probably don't matter very much. Now we're still trying to verify that and we're trying to get this number down as small as we can because we don't want this to be affecting the answer. And this is on the edge of some areas where there is significant cloudiness. And so we wanna make sure we're not actually affecting the answer when we do this. So that's one of the things we have to watch out for. Um, as I'll say in the conclusions, I don't really believe this is too much of a problem. We do this all the time. Partially it's because we have this time split way of doing the numerics. And the processes are all uncertain. Their interactions are uncertain. This constrains them by the ultimate thing that we know, which is basically the laws of thermodynamics. And if you look at the mean state, so this is now looking at global results from these different simulations. Uh, these are free running climate model simulations. They're about five years each. We've run it with the control case. We've run it with the bin microphysics and we've run it then with the emulated bin microphysics in green. And you can see there's quite a bit of spread in the, the temperatures over the, uh, the global temperatures over time. And there's quite a bit of spread in the cloud fraction. Um, this is the rain mass and the liquid mass. And you can see they generally within the, there's not a huge change. It doesn't it radically alter the climate. Uh, there is some systematic change and the blue line here in the liquid, there is a reduction in overall cloud liquid with the new, either the emulator or, uh, or either the bin code or its emulator, but those tend to be pretty similar. This is perhaps one of the most interesting things. Do we really need to do this if it doesn't change the climate? Why go to all this trouble? Let me see if I can explain uh, this plot a little bit. So what this shows is it shows the rain rate, which is the colors as a function of the size of the cloud drops, the effective radius, so bigger is over here, and the amount of liquid water in the atmosphere. And what you can see is that these colors, you can see the scale here for the rain rate. Uh, this is in millimeters per day. So when you have very large drops, in, you tend to get more, uh, you have very large cloud drops, you tend to get more of them falling out, as I said, which means you don't have as much liquid water. And it also means you have higher rain rates. These are the high rain rates. But what you'll notice is that you can have high rain rates almost along this line in the control code, where even for very small particle sizes, you get at high liquid water path, you do get significant auto conversion and accretion. That's that extrapolation of that log scale that I showed on the plot um, originally from the original Krutinoff and Kogan. So, this is actually not observed. When you tend to have small cloud drops, you really don't seem to have, there really isn't observed to be rain. And there's typically a threshold that people talk about. It's something like 15 microns. In fact, it's so noticeable from observations that some people on these bulk schemes impose a threshold where they don't allow auto conversion and accretion to occur until you get 15 micron drops. Well, when we put in the bin code, that whole distribution changes. There are now no more significant rain rates for any liquid water path with all these small effective radius. Effective radius. You, you see this onset of precipitation occurring much more at this 15 micron level, which is not something we're specifying. It's an emergent property of doing this in the climate model, which is actually really neat because this is a pathology of the climate models that leads to them raining probably too often. And you can see that this higher order uh, the, the sort of higher order metric is reproduced almost exactly with the with the machine learning algorithm so we can actually get that and recover that um, and again I should note the one in the middle costs five times as much as the other two to run but we get the same result on the right with the machine learning algorithm at essentially the cost of the control model so this is actually really interesting to us and we think it produces some really nice results that it, it's producing something we really think we should be doing for the rain process, but we, we're not doing in the bulk scheme. This just shows the precipitation intensity. So um, the control model is here. It doesn't produce that much intense rain. 
uh, we're getting more intense precipitation um, when we actually put in this emulator, which is also probably a good thing. Uh, these are high, high amounts, but they happen very infrequently. And this just shows one of the issues with putting in the mass fixer is it does constrain the liquid water. So we don't run out of water that actually reduces the rain rate. You can't have, you don't wanna, th this reduces the rain rate to something that's um, more, uh, a little more reasonable, uh, particularly at the high end, basically. And you can see the emulator does a good job of reproducing these statistics too. The differences out here, you can see these error bars, they start to be very low frequency. And so it's hard to tell what's actually different out there. This is one of the other interesting results. So um, one of the problems with climate models, and you can see, and, and actually an, an argument, uh, it wasn't really an argument. It was a discussion over whether this data is real or not uh, this morning. Um, not with anybody in this room, but you can see that overall the satellites would indicate that it rains about 20% of the time. And the control climate model would indicate it rains about 80% of the time. And that's a big difference. Um, this is the total frequency and this is the frequency just from the large scale precipitation that's governed by the cloud microphysics. This includes say convective clouds that are handled by a slightly different scheme. So when we introduce the uh, the new bin code, whether we emulate it or not, all of a sudden we get a significant reduction in the subtropical regions and the shallow clouds in their precipitation. It's pretty dramatic and does a much better job of reproducing the observations. And that again goes back to this sort of thing where we don't get the onset of precipitation until we hit a threshold of drop sizes, which is related basically to this. Um, so that's another good thing, actually. It gets rid of the sort of fact that we tend to be drizzling way too much in a lot of these regimes uh, in the climate model. It does not help where you have ice precipitation at higher latitudes because we're only messing with the warm rain process. Um, and this is just some plots that show uh, we are getting some differences in the liquid water path, but not much in the ice, not much in the cloud fraction and a little bit of difference in cloud drop numbers. These are sort of overall climate statistics. Uh, some differences pretty substantial in um, the cloud optical depth, but not moderate changes in the overall cloud radiative effects, the, the short wave and the long wave here. So it does reproduce a, a reasonable climate. And this is one of the other last interesting results. Um, the blue line, this is, looking at the cloud feedback. So it's the cloud response to warming up the planet, sort of an idealized calculation. This is in the long wave. So this is change, it's generally positive. This is the short wave, it's also positive, but it gets a little negative at higher latitudes. And what's interesting is that there's a pretty big difference between the new emulator code and the existing code at middle latitudes of the Southern hemisphere. Uh, that seems to be related to a higher ice fraction because we're doing, um, because we are changing the rain formation process, it does impact supercooled liquid. And that's where you see this at higher latitudes. We have a larger ice fraction. We think that actually tends to lower this cloud feedback uh, pretty substantially. So in summary, we've been able to take this new detailed bin model of rain formation, and it improves many aspects of the climate simulations, and particularly the rain onset, the frequency. It may improve the liquid ice balance, and it may adjust the climate sensitivity. Um, we can use it instead of neural networks to emulate this. We recover the speed that we, we don't slow the model down. We can reproduce all the statistics we've looked at in a, in a sort of climate sense. And this is sort of a hand-built set of emulators with separate networks for positive and negative tendencies. In some respects, um, we have to separate out zeros. We have to do all these log transforms. The numerics are not perfect, and we sometimes need uh, mass fixes to put on this. So lessons learned. Um, these processes really challenge the machine learning methods. There's many orders of magnitude. That's why we usually use log transforms to get things a little more regular. Sorting out the zeros and treating positive and negative tendencies separately is also important. And it's not clear if we actually would expect to get absolute conservation. Most of the problems we're seeing where we put these guardrails on it, um, we're trying to make sure they don't dominate the answer and they only kick in for large edge cases. So 
I guess the other thing I'll note is that in doing these feedback calculations, um, we've actually run the model with increased SS, increased warmer temperatures, and we run it with temperatures that the, that the model was never trained on, and it's still stable. So one of the advantages of emulation at the process level is we think by sampling the whole planet over all the seasons that we're not really going out of sample because this is an isolated process, and as long as we are seeing some of these representations somewhere on the planet, we can actually emulate it. Um, so we haven't had too much trouble with stability when we run it either with increased sea surface temperatures or even running it with, say, aerosol, with running it with 1850 conditions in the past. Uh, we've been able to actually go out of sample for some of the climate samples, which is kind of important. And the next steps, um, we're working with David John to simplify these networks. Um, we're building this in as an option for the standard CESM code. We're, we're sort of regularizing the interfaces and as an example of how to do these neural networks and put them in Fortran code to do process emulation as a series of weights um, and trying to generalize the interface a little bit so people can apply it in different places. And then we're developing sort of more tutorial based packages, a toy training data and full training data for people to explore the emulators on their own. And then a sort of workflow for doing the machine learning training and doing uh, messing with the output from the, the model. We have a single column version of the model and you can actually run that on a laptop. Um, we have a whole Docker container that you can download that will allow you to run an entire Earth system model in one column on your on a reasonable laptop. And we're also trying to, to basically get eventually the training data kind of in the leap Pangeo cloud and then have a, a good workflow for Python that would allow people to read in the data and do machine learning training, then export it and be able to test it in these single column models or, or hand it off and be able to run it in a full system model.